and invite Sarah Morney to begin the case for the negative. The problem with a lot of the affirmatives material was, in today's world, and historically, there has never been one form of Indigenous identity. We think the Indigenous peoples of Australia are made up of multiple ethnicities. There are hundreds of different languages, there are like more than hundreds of different types of cultures, and each of them have individual ties to individual parts of land. Which is why only segregating Northern Territory would never be applicable and engaging to all Indigenous Australians. It would never solve the problems of being excluded from Australian society, and in fact it would only enhance the rhetoric and the narrative about the inherent discrimination and racist attitudes towards Indigenous Australians. So two points of rebuttal first. Is there a moral reason to compensate for past generations' mistakes? And secondly, will this be positive benefits for the Indigenous Australians in these communities? So on this idea of moral compensation, Steph told us it was okay to hold the current generation accountable for generations gone by. Because this was because, firstly, we've seen systemic d d d discrimination and we're standing by some forms of it today. We don't think this is okay because, firstly, we don't support like, evil like, discrimination and practices like Australia policy. We think also that many people opposed the North the, the Territory intervention and have said today gone ahead to say we'll never do that again. We're also pro putting in through policies that will help Indigenous Australians achieve all the benefits they wanted to point to by having you know, more like say in how it's to do. We just don't think the best mechanism to do this is giving them an oath of state because especially when they're being financially supported by the state of Australia, they're never really having totally autonomy in the first place. So we don't think it's meaningful autonomy there. We also told you that what is more harmful is, is, is in the circumstances, is that there's still going to remain this pernicious attitude that uh, we should just be ignoring them and showing to the side. So what are the, 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 three, the four main reasons Steph was giving us? This was firstly because the current generations are benefiting from stealing the Indigenous <laughs> Australia's land. Firstly, we don't think you're totally going to be changing that by taking the land out of everyone. But also, we don't think that these people today are in fact liable for their like, past generations. Just because by the lottery of birth I was born here and perhaps my like, relatives came more discrimination doesn't mean I should be held accountable because I did not commit that. I did not consent to those actions taking place. So that is why we don't hold people accountable for past generational mistakes. And we don't do that in any other circumstance today. Secondly, said, um, so that also applied to the idea of the analysis of continuation. But we already told you that there is no continuation because different governments are different and we should not hold other governments accountable for them. We saw that when there was a direct difference between Kevin Rudd's Labor government saying sorry when past Liberal governments had failed to do so. That is because there is differences between governments so we shouldn't be holding them accountable between them. Thirdly, that's because that we said okay to the Northern Terror intervention and ideas of that of course. Firstly, I've already told you, some of us oppose that, so why are we holding everyone accountable? Secondly, we don't think we're benefiting all Indigenous Australians, only a select few who live in Northern Territory, so there's only a half title. Also, when they want to tell us that native title rights and land rights were just not good enough, we thought that was wrong. That's because the main reason they pointed to for that was that they're very rare because they're hard to prove. They're hard to prove because people are tied to different areas. You can't prove that everyone was tied to like the Northern Territory because they weren't. So which means we're not actually like helping all indigenous communities. And in fact, we're creating this <laughs> harmful idea of homogenizing indigenous identity into one monolithic group, which it is definitely not. Also, the final analysis she had on this was that native title was just a white analysis of property law. That we think that many indigenous Australians having brought up in modern day context accept like the wildly universal, worldly like understanding of property law. So we think that was fine that many do opt into that and that is okay. So on the second point of why the positive benefits they want to bring to community and why it wouldn't happen. Firstly, because as I've already told you, you're homogenizing their identity. They, um, secondly, um, she wanted to tell us how it's important for them to have this choice, like have democratic authority. We thought it was a problematic when they clearly said only 2% of Australia's population are Indigenous. We think this state of Northern Territory will be a skeleton country with no one living it because there will be a mass exodus and pressure for any white people to leave it, which we think is unfair firstly on those who may be living there totally okay and never discrimination against Indigenous. But also secondly it means that they don't have the people who are there to actually enact good policies, which means if you're cutting them off from like the intervention of Australia, it means some problems can only be tackled by professionals, i.e. you need to see a psychiatrist to deal with like severe drug abuse problems. You need like educators to tell you the best educational policies. You need police to do crime. And it was very interesting when Steph wanted to say that crime was just becoming because they're part of Australia. We think crime is coming from the fact that they don't have jobs and access to good education. We think cutting them off from the Australia's resources does not change that problem. We'll still have disillusioned youth unable to like get employment and the problems. So 
We also think the government won't work, as I'll go into my substantive, because we think, firstly, you'll have too many opposing parties and views. We don't have like the historical background and framework to build up a political, um, current political um, like framework parties. We also think that it means you'll have lots of tribes with very different views of how they want to express their law, because they come from different backgrounds, as I'll be dealing with in my substantive today. So, my first point I'm going to talk about you is when is secession good and why this doesn't apply to this circumstance. This is because for a few main reasons. Firstly, we think to be a good, successful state, you need cohesive cultural identity. Whether in Australia that narrative is if we're multicultural and have this shared history, um, it's important when you're looking at ideas of individual succession. So for instance, we think that indigenous identity, as I've already told you, is incredibly diverse. There are multiple nations from all over Australia. They have different things. They have different languages. They have different belief systems, different dream time stories, different legal frameworks. So they can't just easily bind together for one thing. So that's secondly the problem, because we don't have a common basis here for legal governance. It means, firstly, we don't have the institutions, because some in like in indigenous society might now be pro like circle sentencing, others might be pro like just keeping on with the Western traditional law. It means they have a lot of conflict and be incredibly hard to resolve. Secondly, we don't think they have any like systemic like past frameworks to be holding them there to account. As I've already told you, it's gonna be a very fractured political system with different like tribal groups um, warring for their thing. We think that like, secession is only okay when there's actually like a cohesive identity group which needs to break away from like an ethnic threat, which isn't happening in Australia. We think we're moving towards being less racist and being more accepting of indigenous identity, so there's no need for that to happen there. So we also think that maybe the reason if you have a specific historical tie to a specific era, but the problem in this circumstance is people have different historic ties to all parts of Australia, so you're just disadvantaging those who aren't part of it and saying that they just have to accept like Northern Territory, like a kind of indigenous tribes, who will then be like strategically advantaged over all other parts of Australian indigenous identity. Because none of the reasonable justifications for succeeding from Australia are fulfilled in this circumstance, we don't think they should, because they won't be able to form a cohesive society. They have no like, legal and historical framework for like a good civil society, and that's problematic. So now, why will this policy be a failure? I'll firstly look at why the state won't function, and secondly, the harms to the individuals within it. The state won't function because they have intense resource depravities. They're in like rural areas and no infrastructure. And even with the aid from the Australian government, we don't think that's going to be able to last long because cross-subsidy from the federal government will, in the end, have problematic. This is because, firstly, when any right-wing government comes in, they're going to use this as a race-baiting exercise of why are we funding this autonomous region that doesn't want like Australia and doesn't want to be part of Australia. So they'll be able to cut back at then. Secondly, we think that it's going to be mostly put off the policy agenda. It means that long term it reduces the nation's interest in fixing this area and we don't see it as part of real Australia. We just see it as like little fake Australia that we don't really care about, like New Zealand. Thirdly, we think... <laughs> Thirdly, we think that often the elites and like the ruling powers in these parties will be the ones who are most keen about autonomy and like disadvantage themselves to Australia. So won't accept things like tight aid, they won't have control about it, and we're not sure they'll be able to direct them properly. That's because they lack the institutional capacity. This is problematic because they're a very poor and small society. It means they don't have educated people like doctors in this society necessarily, and we don't see many who want to go live there when it's not part of actual Australia. We also don't think you have experienced bureaucracy like politicians and skilled people. We don't think you'll have an effective police force when you have no instruments to train them. It will be incredibly hard to build up this socially system. And we think this is comparable to the Nunawak community in Canada when an Inuit party had autonomy and it's now reduced to a thing where it's falling apart. So what we think is that because it is undermining the ability of Indigenous Australians to be recognised in their diverse capacity and will be a flawed state, we were proud to uh, propose. I'd like to thank Sarah for her speech and invite Daniel Farina to continue the case for the affirmative team.